Africa. Welcome aboard, everybody. Let's kick it off and get it going. Now, I'm a naturopathic physician. I have over 25 years of clinical experience in the delivery of science-based, clinically verified alternatives to drugs and surgery into the medical marketplace. Uh, I have a private consultation business that's called Second Opinion. I have a radio show that hours uh, Monday through Friday from 3 to 5 p.m. Central Time, and you can gain access to that through the World Wide Web by going to this website, which is probably where you went to get to this webinar tonight. Fire your MD now. This is also a book that I wrote. Uh, I'm a strong advocate of knowledge and of helping people to understand medical concepts which heretofore you have been led to believe are complicated. Most of the stuff that goes on in the body is not very complicated. The concepts that doctors are taught are really pretty simple and pretty straightforward. It's You just haven't had it explained to you that way. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm such a strong advocate of education. And by the way, if you look up the word doctor in, in Latin, it translates to docere, which means teacher. Now, you may have noticed the initials after my name are ND. It stands for naturopathic doctor. In order to become a naturopathic doctor, you need four years of pre-med, four years of naturopathic medical school, uh, you get about a thousand hours of clinical supervision. You have to pass national boards and state boards in order to secure a license. You have to do 25 plus hours of continuing education credit a year in order to be licensed as a naturopathic physician. And naturopathic medicine is unique in the world because it is the only licensed physician training program, doctoral program, which teaches from the bottom up a holistic methodology. And a holistic methodology is extremely important and extremely unique. Holistic medical philosophy argues that the human body is endowed with a God-given intelligence, a God-given vital force, that the human body knows how to fix itself, the human body wants to fix itself. The human body is struggling all of the time, trying to fix itself. It's the naturopathic physician's job to deliver science-based, clinically verified therapeutics to people, the intention of which are to support and promote your body's ability to fix itself. Now, part of this deal with holistic medicine is we need to give the body nutrition. And we're big advocates of holistic medical nutrition. And if you're interested in holistic medical nutrition, you should go into the archives of my website. If you're a guest, if you were invited here tonight by someone, have them uh, send you an archived webinar that I've done concerning the 90 essential nutrients. We're big advocates of nutrifying the body appropriately because, quite frankly, it's impossible to get all of the nutrition that the body needs from food. You just can't do it. Now, in addition to nutrifying the body, we also advise people to stop eating stuff that's gumming up the works. And herein lies the subject matter for tonight's webinar. <clears throat> Ten foods you should absolutely, positively, never, ever look at, let alone eat. And I'm going to walk us through each and every one of them right now, starting with everybody's favorite, whole grains. Wheat, barley, rye, and oats are four of the worst foods you could ever possibly hope to eat. And I want you to consider something as we're talking about this information tonight, as we're going down the track here tonight. We have let the people who make the food tell us which food is healthy. And we have let MDs, physicians, MD physicians, who have no training, no experience, no respect, and no appreciation for medical nutrition, tell us which foods to eat. Quite frankly, we've taken the wrong dog to the hunt. 
if you want advice about which foods are healthy for the body and which foods are unhealthy for the body, well, you've come to exactly the right place because the naturopathic medical profession exists to answer these questions. This is our domain. If you want to know which chest spreaders to use and which anesthesiology machine works the best and which heart-lung machine works the best, if you want to know which scalpel and which suture material works the best, then talk to Dr. Oz. That's Dr. Oz's domain. If you'd like to know about science-based, clinically verified alternatives to drugs and surgery with an emphasis on medical nutrition, you want to talk to us, naturopathic physicians. So let's get into it without any further ado. 570 people now in the house. <clears throat> Welcome aboard, everybody. Does my heart good to see so many people from all over the world huddling around this campfire. The problem with wheat, barley, rye, and oats is the protein in the grain. The protein in the grain is called gluten. Gluten is a collective term for the protein that's found in wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Gluten is the stuff that makes flour from wheat, barley, rye, and oats rubbery and flexible. It's the gluten which acts like glue, pun intended, and gives the dough elasticity, gives the flour elasticity. This is one of the reasons why it's... Um, so uh, so utilized because the elasticity given to the flour uh, by virtue of the gluten lends you know really nice uh, qualities to uh, aesthetic qualities uh, to the flour but when it comes to your health not so good so gluten is the protein that's in wheat barley rye and oats and gluten is uh, the molecule which lends elasticity uh, to doughs made from these grains. Now, <clears throat> remember gluten is a protein, and any protein is simply uh, a daisy-chained group of amino acids. It's a bunch of amino acids that have been daisy-chained together. Now, amino acids are essential nutrients for the human body. You couldn't live without them. This is uh, a representation of uh, gliadin, uh, which is one of the gluten proteins found in wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Uh, proteins can become extremely complicated structures. This is egg white protein. This is an actual electron microscopic photograph that's been colorized by an artist of what um, egg white protein looks like. Uh, proteins are extremely complicated architectural structures. But in the final analysis, they simply are a group of amino acids which are daisy-chained together. And it's the stomach's job. It's the acid in the stomach's job to break the bonds that keep the amino acids together, liberating the amino acids, which is a good idea. It's very similar to if you had a string of pearls and you broke the string and let all the pearls go. Well... That's what the stomach attempts to do with any protein that finds its way into the stomach. The stomach's job is to break the bonds which keep the amino acids together, liberating the amino acids, because this is why you need to eat protein, to get the individual amino acids, and this has to happen inside the stomach. The only problem is the chemical bonds that exist in wheat, barley, rye, and oat protein are extremely hard to break. Here's a little overview of the human digestive tract. Let's, let's take an amble through the human digestive tract, shall we? That's the liver. That's the little gallbladder hiding underneath the liver. This, of course, is the stomach, and it's the stomach's job to break the proteins apart into their constituent amino acids. This is the colon, or the large intestine. This, by the way, is the appendix, a little appendix hanging down there. 
And what we need to talk about tonight, what we need to focus on is this part of the anatomy right here, the small intestines. The small intestines job is to absorb nutrients that you have just eaten, that your stomach has dig just digested, hopefully, into your bloodstream. Now, this is what the small intestine looks like if you were to cut it in half. It's a tube populated with millions of tissue called villi. And you see on the left hand part, it looks like a plush rug inside of the intestinal tract. Well, if you zoom in on that, on those protruding structures inside the intestinal tract, they're called intestinal villi. And it is the job of the intestinal villi to absorb the molecules of food that you have just eaten and bring them into the bloodstream. That's the job of the intestinal villi. It's the job of the stomach to dissolve everything that you just swallowed into a liquid. The stomach is basically a big bag of acid, a big bag of acid. And when everything is working the way that nature intended it to, the acid in the stomach dissolves whatever it was that you just swallowed into a liquid. The liquid passes then into the small intestine, and the little villi in the small intestine absorb the molecules and bring them into the bloodstream. And that's how we get nutrition into the body, through the intestinal villi. It's fascinating, actually. The problem here, however, is the gluten protein in wheat, barley, rye, and oats is virtually impossible for the stomach to digest. Here it is again. This is one of the proteins, gliadin, one of the proteins. And remember, the stomach is like a bag of acid, and it's the stomach's job to chop the amino acids up to break the bonds, break the chemical bonds in the amino acids, liberating, liberating the individual consistent amino, amino acids. But the acid in the stomach can't do that. So rather than having individual amino acids now trying to be absorbed by the intestinal villi, you don't. You have an entirely intact, long, complicated architectural protein that the villi try to absorb. And that leads to nothing but trouble. When the intestinal villi attempt to absorb an undigested protein, they become destroyed. The villi become destroyed. Now, is that good or is that bad? That's bad. Now, depending upon the level of destruction of the villi, you will come down with irritable bowel, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, etc., etc., etc. All of these illnesses from the holistic point of view are reflections of the same metabolic process, just different levels of destruction, different amounts of destruction. And by the way, there are billions of villi and microvilli in the intestinal tract, all of which are under the sway of whatever you just ate. And so depending upon your particular uh, sensitivity to the gluten molecule, depending upon your stomach's ability to digest it or not, usually not, every time you eat wheat, barley, rye, and oats, you're going to destroy the villi, which is one of life's greatest ironies. This means the staff of life, whole grains, are one of the worst foods you can eat because when you eat them, they destroy the villi, which leads to malabsorption, which if you've listened to me, if you followed me long enough, you will know malabsorption is the genesis of all chronic disease. You don't have high blood pressure because you have a bad gene. You don't have arthritis because you have a voodoo curse. You don't have... Uh, fibromyalgia uh, because you're getting older. <clears throat> Chronic diseases are rooted in nutrient deficiencies. Period. 
your body has run out of the nutrition it needs in order to optimize its structure and function. No different than your automobile. If your automobile runs out of oil, the engine seizes. Is there anything wrong with the engine? No. You just ran out of oil. Well, it's the same with the human body. If you need 90 essential nutrients, which you do, and you eat whole grains for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the whole grains destroy your body's or interfere remarkably with your body's ability to absorb nutrients. And if this, this information is compelling to you, just this information about wheat, barley, rye, and oats can save people's lives. I have a free video, it's on my website, called Against the Grain. Yeah, I, I recommend that you send it to everybody in your life because everybody needs to stop eating wheat, barley, rye, and oats. But nobody does. And if you'd like to prove it to yourself, by the way, there's no amount of lab work that can dial in specifically whether or not you have a problem with gluten because from our point of view, the problem here is not an allergic condition. It is not an allergy. It's a mechanical problem. It's a mechanical destruction that's happening, which is separate and distinct from an allergic reaction. We recommend everybody march quickly towards gluten-free land. And if you'd like to prove it to yourself, if you really just can't wrap your head around the notion that whole grains are bad for you, then my recommendation become gluten-free, 100% gluten-free for 14 days in a row. 14 days in a row. And then on day 15, all I want you to do is eat gluten have pancakes for breakfast, uh, cereal for lunch, a sandwich, a bagel, cookies, crackers, pizza, pasta. Go crazy for gluten on day 15 and tell me how you feel. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. When you get away from the stuff that you've developed or um, you've habituated to, you've habituated to the net negative response of gluten because you've been eating it your whole life. You have forgotten what it's like to feel good in your digestive tract. So you need to shake it up a little bit. You need to open the windows and take a breath of fresh air. Go gluten-free for 14 days. And then on day 15, eat a whole bunch of gluten and tell me how you feel. <clears throat> Next on the list is fried food. Or should I say, death by fried food. After wheat, barley, rye, and oats, fried food is a big, bad voodoo daddy. I don't even want you to be downwind of fried food, and here's why. When you fry something, a chemical is created from the protein called acrylamide. Acrylamide is not so bad except for two things. It causes cancer and inflammation. <laughs> I mean, for goodness sake, it causes cancer. You think that's a good thing not to be around? I mean, we get all up in arms about asbestos exposure, don't we? Where everybody's on the no cigarettes smoking 15 feet away from the entrance to a restaurant. No more cigarettes in the restaurant because of the carcinogenic effects. Well, I got to tell you something. If I had to choose whether to smoke a cigarette or eat a French fry, I'd smoke the cigarette. Acrylamide is one nasty chemical. This is a very interesting map. This is old data, but still, it, it, I mean, it works for um, sake of um, education here. This is a map in the United States of life expectancy at birth uh, for males. Now, on this map, if it's red, you're dead. This is a coloration on this map is county by county and the states or the counties which are colored red the people that live in those counties have the shortest life expectancies of anybody in the United States by five to eight years the people that live in the red counties have shortened lifespan by five to eight years now do you notice any pattern there you notice any pattern it's the Confederate South, the old Confederate South, and a couple of Indian reservations in the West, a couple of Native American reservations in the West. What is different in this part of the world 
that's different than the rest of the United States. It's the same education, it's the same hospitals, it's the same doctors, it's the same drugs, it's the same water, it's the same sewage systems, it's the same food. Well, not so much. Because I don't know if you've ever been to the South. I love the South. The people in the South are the kindest, nicest people I've ever met. But everybody in the South eats fried food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when you eat fried food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're going to die, sucker. But before you die, you're going to suffer. Then you're going to lose all your money to these guys. And then you're going to die through nothing other than lack of knowledge. I mean, for goodness sake, this guy's been dead for, what, 30 years, and he's still killing people. I mean, French fries and fried chicken? They shoot me now. This is why people in the Confederate South and on Native American reservations have the sh shortest lifespans of anybody in the U.S. It's because of fried food consumption in the acrylamides. Fried food literally will shorten your life. It will kill you. It will kill you slowly. Look, you stop smoking cigarettes. That's a good thing. You know, you, you cleaned up the schools so then the workplace where so there's no more asbestos. That's a good thing. You get out of the coal mine now, you've got a respirator so you don't get black lung. That's a good thing. But one more thing we need to do as a nation is eliminate fried food completely. I don't even want you to look at fried food. Zero tolerance for anything fried. I do not care what it is. If there is fried in the label, fried rice, stir fried organic vegetables harvested by Trappist monks under a full moon while they're chanting, I don't care. It's fried. You're going to die. Don't eat it. Unless, of course, you want to shorten your lifespan, <clears throat> then go for it. My people are destroyed by lack of knowledge. By the way, who told you to eat this stuff? People that make it. That's who told you to eat it. Now, here we go. Everybody's favorite olive oil. In addition to fried food, olive oil is a bad substance. It is a bad substance for human consumption. Why did we get on the olive oil kick in the first place? Remember what started that? It was a Mediterranean diet, right? Researchers went around the Mediterranean and they saw that people who lived on the coast of the Mediterranean had significantly longer lifespans than people that lived inland. And they figured, well, it must be what they eat. So what do people in the Mediterranean coast eat? Because they live longer. That's the whole deal. The Mediterranean diet is supposed to live longer. Well, they eat fish, nuts, vegetables, cheese, whole wheat bread, red wine, and olive oil. Because of their inclusion of olive oil in the Mediterranean diet, because of the inclusion of olive oil in the Mediterranean diet, the world went crazy. The horse was out of the barn, and the world went crazy for olive oil. It didn't hurt that Dr. Oz said it's a great thing to eat. Uh, it didn't hurt that the olive oil industry said it's a great thing to eat. Everybody took that ball and ran with it, and nobody studied the data except my colleague, Dr. Wallach. Nobody took into consideration the Sardinian variable. Now, here's a map of the Mediterranean. <clears throat> you see there's Spain and Gibraltar and North Africa. And way over in the right-hand corner is Italy. And there's a little island off the northwest coast of Italy right there called Sardinia. 
Now, as far as longevity is concerned, the Sardinians were the longest lived people in the Mediterranean by another five years. They lived five years longer than the people on the coast who followed the Mediterranean diet. The only difference between the Sardinian diet and the diet of the people who lived on the coast is the Sardinians hated olive oil. This is one of the reasons why the term greaser came into <clears throat> consideration as a derogatory term for Italians because the Sardinians called everybody else besides them, you know, greasers. Because they ate olive oil, they drank olive oil, they used olive oil, the Sardinians did not. But when the people did the Mediterranean diet study, they neglected the Sardinian variable. Either by choice or just because of incompetence, they didn't take it into consideration. So, the Mediterranean diet will extend your lifespan five, five years more or less from the way that people in mainland Europe eat, but if you want to get another five years, you cut out olive oil. It's an interesting thing to think about, and really the evolution of olive oil into popular culture has more to do with the food industry than it does with anything else. <clears throat> it became reality by consensus. Everybody agreed that olive oil was a really good thing, and it stuck, even though, quite frankly, it was incorrect. I don't want to say it's a lie, but it was incorrect. Well, so what's the deal with olive oil anyway? I mean, why is it so bad? Well, olive oil <clears throat> causes oxidative damage. Oxidative damage is everywhere all the time. Oxidative damage is a fact of life. Oxidative damage happens everywhere all of the time. Iron turns to rust because of oxidative damage. People get old and die because of oxidative damage. Fruit goes bad, vegetables go bad, food goes bad because of oxidative damage. Oxidative damage is everywhere all of the time, and when oxidative damage happens inside the body, it's not pretty. Oxidative damage is linked to high blood pressure. It's linked to all kinds of pain in the body. It's linked to all kinds of arthritis. It's linked to all kinds of heart disease. It's linked to, you know, you get liver spots on your face, on your skin. It's got nothing to do with the health of your liver. It's oxidative damage to the oil, the fat in your skin. Your, it's rancid fat in your skin. It's caused by oxidative damage. Cancer caused by oxidative damage. Oxidative damage is everywhere all the time. It is a big bad voodoo daddy. And anything that you can do to decrease your body's exposure to oxidative stress oxidative damage would be a very smart thing to do. And herein lies our conversation about olive oil. Because check it out. Oxidative damage is caused by oxygen atoms that have lost an electron. When oxygen atoms lose an electron they become very sticky and they stick to whatever they can. When something is stuck to by an oxygen atom, it becomes oxidized. When it becomes oxidized, your it becomes broken and destroyed. Oxygen atoms stick to tissue in the body. That tissue becomes oxidized. When the tissue becomes oxidized, it's on the way out. The 10 bad foods all contribute to oxidative stress. They all do. Fried food and oil in a bottle are the greatest contributors of oxidative stress to the human body. You know, other things like crap in the food, crap in the air, crap in the water, right? Automobile pollution, automobile exhaust, secondhand smoke, ionizing radiation, ultraviolet radiation, too much. All of these things cause oxidative damage. And there's not a whole lot you can do about those things, you know, except move to the country and live in a bubble. Nobody's going to do that. But you can do a great deal about the food sources of oxidative stress. And this is why this is such a very, very important thing for people to know, for people to understand, for people to get.
<clears throat> so the 10 bad foods contribute to oxidative damage. Fried food and olive oil being the biggest culprits. The body also has an internal fire department, right? The body has a police department, which is the immune system. It kills things. The body also has a fire department. It puts out the fires of oxidative damage. It puts out the fires of inflammation caused by oxidative damage. These substances are referred to as antioxidants. This is why, on the other side of the coin in these health webinars, when we talk about medical nutrition, we're not talking about medical nutrition tonight. We're talking about foods to avoid. We're not talking about what to put into the body. We're talking about what to remove from the body, what to not let into the body. Antioxidants, which I've done an entire webinar on, I've done an entire 45-minute webinar just on antioxidants, are one of the keys to health. 90 essential nutrients, antioxidants, eliminate the 10 bad foods. When you do these three things, take the 90 essential nutrients into your body appropriate for body weight, take antioxidants in the proper amounts, and eliminate the 10 bad foods, you are going to live a long and happy, and well, I don't know if you'll be happy, you're going to live a long and healthy life. Now here's the deal with olive oil. <clears throat> you see in that bottle, it's a bottle of olive oil, you've got the bottle, you've got the cap, you've got the olive oil, and then you've got this stuff at the top of the bottle. Well, what is that? That's air. <laughs> what does air have in it? Oxygen. What does oxygen do? It oxidizes things. So olive oil oxidizes with time. You have no idea how long it's been sitting on the shelf. You have no idea how long it was in the truck. You have no idea how long it was sitting at the distribution center before it got on the truck, before it got into the supermarket. By the time you open the top of that bottle, it could be completely oxidized. And regretfully, there's no real down and dirty, easy way to measure how much oxidation has happened in the oil. So to err on the side of caution, we say, don't eat it. Don't use it. Follow the Sardinians, not the olive oil industry. Now look, oxidation is all about time. If you're just hooked on olive oil and you can't imagine a life without olive oil, if olive oil is your thing and you, you just have to have it, then I want you to grow an olive tree in your backyard, grow an olive tree in your kitchen, and every time you want olive oil, you pluck the olives off of the tree, you put them in some type of a press and squeeze the oil out of them. And eat it immediately, but don't heat with it. Because when you heat with any oil, yes, this includes coconut oil, this includes any oil, it oxidizes. It oxidizes rapidly when you heat it. This is why frying food is a bad thing. Now, you can cook anything you want in a fry pan if you use lard or butter. Technically, frying is cooking stuff in a superheated oil. We don't like oil for cooking. We hate it. Don't even want to look at it. But we're okay with butter or lard. Isn't that interesting? It's exactly the opposite of what you've been taught. And by the way, what you've been taught, how's that working for you? How's your health? You getting better every year? You getting healthier every year? Have you plateaued out and you're feeling good? Is that what's happening? Or are you getting worse? Autism has risen from 1 in 20,000, 1 in 10,000, to 1 in 80. Alzheimer's is now the sixth leading cause of death. It came out of nowhere. Heart disease rates unchanged, cancer rates unchanged, chronic disease on the rise, life expectancy going down. Why? Because we've taken advice from the wrong people about what to do for health. Period. Your MD is the last person to go to for advice about health care. 
If you've got a bleeding artery or a broken bone or a nasty parasite, they're exactly the person you want to see. But if you want to optimize the structure and function of the human body, you need to visit a naturopath who has a clue. Gee, I, I wonder where you could find somebody like that. Now, if you don't follow this advice, if you use olive oil that's in a bottle, you're going to be pouring free radicals into the body, which are going to oxidize tissues in the body. It's only a matter of time before you die. But remember, before you die, you're going to suffer. You're going to lose all your money to the MDs with their ineffective, nonsense, ridiculous, archaic, dangerous treatments. And then you're going to die. I mean, death is inevitable. Suffering is optional. You tune your car up, you make sure it has all the right fluids, you wouldn't put diesel fuel in an unleaded engine, but you eat whatever you want and you drink whatever you want with feeling that you're Superman or Superwoman, and honestly, it's not your fault. It's your doctor's fault. Your doctor is the person that's supposed to be in charge of your health, but they have dropped the ball. Follow our advice, you stand a very good chance of living long and prospering. Next on the 10 bad food list, carbonated beverages. What? What's wrong with a carbonated beverage? Well, I'm so happy that you asked. Carbonated beverages, the bubbles in anything carbonated is carbon dioxide. What does carbon dioxide do? It neutralizes stomach acid. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad idea. Your stomach acid wants to be acidic. <clears throat> when you neutralize the stomach acid, your stomach cannot digest the stuff that you just ate. Remember, it's your stomach's job to turn everything into a liquid mush, to chemically dissolve everything. Well, if the stomach acid has just been neutralized by carbon dioxide, it can't do that. So one of the worst things anybody can do is wash down a meal with anything that has bubbles in it. I don't care if it's club soda or Perrier, uh, soda pop, ginger ale, beer, champagne, I don't care. If it's got bubbles in it, you should not drink it before or with a meal. If you do, you're just going to get empty calories and you're going to accentuate nutrient deficiencies, malabsorption. This time the problem is that your stomach just couldn't chop the food up the way that it needed to. So even if the villi are intact in the intestinal tract, they can't absorb it because the stuff is too big for the villi to absorb. It passes through and you eliminate it. So washing down lunch with a Coke or anything that has bubbles in it is a fool's errand and it will accelerate your nutrient deficiencies, guaranteed. Well done red meat and crunchy potato skins, yum yum, well sorry not so much. Now the emphasis here is on well done red meat and the skins of a baked potato, yam or sweet potato. It has to be baked you know, or fried quite frankly. Well done red meat and the crunchy skins of baked potatoes, baked yams, and baked sweet potatoes contain a nasty chemical called a heterocyclic amine. Heterocyclic amines cause cancer. Now meat is not the problem. The potato is not the problem. It's how it's cooked. You want to eat meat, have it rare or medium rare. You could have it raw but for goodness sake, don't do that because that's just gross. Rare or medium rare is the way to go. And if you want to have a potato, do like my Irish ancestors did, don't you know, and just boil it up. Boil it up, laddie. Tastes great. You can boil a potato. You can stew a potato. You can crock pot a potato, yam or a sweet potato. And when you do that, the skins are perfectly fine for you. 
but if you bake them, you're going to die. But first you're going to suffer, then you're going to go bankrupt, and then you're going to die. And it's the same for meat. It's not the meat, it's how it's cooked. And it's what's in the meat. Nitrates are added to meat as preservatives. When a nitrate is heated, it turns into a nasty chemical called a nitrosamine. And guess what a nitrosamine does? It causes cancer. It causes inflammation. It causes oxidative damage. The most common meats that have this crap in it are sausages, bacon, pepperoni, deli ham, and deli turkey. But fear not. Have no fear. The nature path is here. You can have as much sausage, bacon, pepperoni, ham, and turkey as you want as long as there's no nitrates in it. You got to be a smart shopper. You got to get knowledge. You have to empower yourself with the right stuff. You have to know what's going on so you don't die needlessly. I have bacon three, four times a week. My bacon doesn't have nitrates in it. I love turkey. It's one of my favorite meals. Thanksgiving dinner, are you kidding me? My turkey doesn't have nitrates in it. You can find these meats without nitrates. By the way, if there's a Whole Foods in your neighborhood, one of Whole Foods' things is all of the meat that they have is nitrate-free. So get a clue and make a big difference in your life moving forward. This is the list, right? Wheat, barley, rye and oats, oil in a bottle, fried food, a carbonated drink with a meal. Don't look at them, let alone eat them. Stop eating them. Well done, red meat. Stop it. Bad dog, no biscuit. Meat with nitrates. And the skins of baked potatoes, yams, and sweet potatoes. Stop it. Don't do it. These things are hurting you slowly. You know, it's like that thing that they told every every medical student is told this. If you if you you get a pot of water, room temperature water, and you put a frog in it, and you slowly start to boil it, the frog will stay in the water until it boils to death because it gets used to the rising heat, habituates to it. But if you throw a frog in boiling water, it jumps right out. Well, guess what? You have habituated to feeling crappy because your entire life you've been eating these foods all of the time, which is why everybody is sick. You kidding me? The all-American meal. Well, let's look at what we've got. We've got a wheat bun, we've got a well-done hamburger, we've got American cheese, which is solidified oil, there's mayonnaise on that hamburger, which is solidified oil, there's french fries, and a Coke. The breakfast of champions. The only thing good in that sandwich is the tomato and the lettuce and the ketchup. The tomato and the lettuce and the ketchup. That's it. And maybe the ice that's in the glass of Coke. But nobody knows this. I mean, you wouldn't feed your child arsenic. You wouldn't feed your child bugs. You wouldn't feed your child, you know, milk that had gone sour. But you're only too happy to give him French fries. You're only too happy to give him fried chicken. Only too happy to let him have a Coke as long as it's a diet Coke. It's nonsense. My people are destroyed by lack of knowledge. This is our gross, gross national product. Unbelievably bad health generated by a medical profession 
that is not concerned with what causes disease, a medical profession that does not practice health care, a medical profession that practices disease management in a profit-based system, exclusively using drugs and surgery to manage the problem, not to cure the problem. And we take advice on what to eat from the people who make the food. <laughs> Everybody is sick. And this is half of the reason why. 